stimulants for volatile substances because you essentially you evaporate them to dryness and you would lose the un you lose the volatile substances so you won't get a reasonable representation of a specific migration limit it's acceptable for overall migration it's not acceptable for specific migration Simulant D2 can be used in less vacuum conditioning the sample is necessary, which can be in the case of polyamides. Uh, but for substances with a boiling point of less than 300 degrees centigrade, you need to demonstrate consistent recovery by spiking some blank oil. Uh, substance must be stable in the simulant, as always, and stability must be demonstrated. Overall migration test resistance conditions must be suitable for the specific migration determination or the SM testing conditions used for OM testing. So in other words, you have to use the more severe specific migration testing conditions uh, to do your OM testing if you're going to use this particular uh, form of substitution. And you have to recalculate the overall migration result in mg per decimeter squared uh, from mix per decimeter squared into mix per kilo food using the surface area to volume ratio or the standard of six uh, mix per kilo. This actually works for the ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol in PET, where you often get an overall migration result of less than one mix per decimeter squared. Um, which is six mg per kilo. And the SML of the, uh, the two glycols together is 30 mg per kilo. So your overall migration result is telling you that you cannot possibly have 30 mg per kilo of um, glycol migration. Screening by residual content. So, you determine the concentration of the uh, migrant in a polymer by some validated method. Dissolution and reprecipitation, which, for example, works with polystyrene. Exhaustive extraction, so keep going until no more is extracted. Or headspace, if your uh, analyte is suitably volatile. And then you calculate 100% mass transfer, either from the full thickness or the layer thickness for which total mass transfer assumptions can be made. And these are illustrated on the next slide for high density polyethylene and polyesters. Ah, this is better. This is what the other table that dropped off the bottom ought to have actually looked like. Very similar thing. You've got the polyethylene at the top, the polyesters at the bottom. You've got various uh, molecular weight ranges for your specific migrant. And then you've got your layer thicknesses that you use for calculation of 100% mass transfer um, below in each column, according to the molecular weight of the migrant. And once again, you can clearly see the difference in diffusion properties between a, a polyolefin and a polyester. And just like last time, I can supply the same data to anybody who sends me an email for a whole bunch of other polymers as well. You can screen by the use of an accepted migration diffusion model. Once again, you need an accurate determination of the concentration of the migrant in the polymer, like some sort of method that you validated, or possibly the polymer manufacturer will reveal the concentration used under the terms generally of some sort of confidentiality agreement. Um, they often have to be made with an independent lab or independent consultant, incidentally, but some companies will reveal that and save you an awful lot of specific migration um, testing as a result. Migration modeling can then be performed using one of the recognized models, providing the migration of the substance is diffusion controlled. And there is a whole bunch of guidance on this. Uh, practical guidelines on the application of migration modeling for the estimation of specific migration. The web link is just there. Alternative, you employ somebody like me to do it for you. And the use of screening food simulants. Simulant B is the most severe simulant for 
acidic foods, naturally, and migrants that can be protonated, e.g. amines, primary aromatic amines, etc., and inorganic migrants, soluble in acetic acid, metal salts, metal oxides, etc. 50% ethanol or 95% ethanol can be used in place of similar C and D1 respectively. C, of course, being 20% ethanol, and D1 being 50% ethanol. Um, all foods are covered by a combination of simulants A, B, and D2. But you can omit simulant B if there are no substance present that can be protonated. You can just use D2 if you have experimental proof that it gives the highest results. You can use 95% ethyl or isoctane in place of D2 if you have experimental proof that one of them gives a higher result than D2. Or you can use any extraction test in place of D2 if you have experimental proof that it gives a higher result. So, functional barriers. Well, these reduce the migration of a substance to less than 10 micrograms per kilo. And at that sort of level, you can actually have on listed substances present outside of the functional barrier and you don't actually have to have them listed and if you've got listed substances on the non-food contact side of the barrier you don't have to test for them um, the next slide gives the thicknesses of hdp and polyesters which act as a functional barrier and as i say by definition if you have a functional barrier and specific migration limits cannot be succeeded exceeded and you do not have to do specific migration testing Six um, microns of aluminium is a functional barrier to migration at all contact times and conditions, providing the aluminium doesn't contain any pinholes, which is generally assumed it doesn't, of course. So polymer thicknesses for functional barriers. Um, and you can use migration modeling to further refine the data in this table once the exact molecular mass of the migrant is known. You will see that HDPE, if your time and temperature of testing is 10 days at 60 degrees centigrade, and you've got a low molecular weight migrant. There is no thickness that will stop the migrant getting through to the food. Um, and similarly, if one looks down at the polyesters, once again, one sees that the uh, the layer thicknesses, which do constitute a functional barrier, are much thinner than they are for HDP. And once again, I can provide the same data to anybody who emails me or um, the standard block of polymers that I've shown twice already. Testing frequency. You only need to repeat migration tests when the product formulation or manufacturing process changes, unless you have specific migration results that are close to the specific migration limit minus the analytical tolerant, when you should test often enough to establish statistical certainty. or your OM results with simulant D2 are in the range 10 to 30 mg per decimeter square, where an annual repeat will establish statistical certainty, or OM results with simulants, the aqueous simulants A, B, C, and D1 are in the range 10 to 12 mg per decimeter square. Once again, an annual repeat will establish statistical certainty. Once you've done a few annual repeats, you'll actually see that um, the, uh, the 10 plus the analytical tolerance, which you're permitted, is not exceeded. Note that the UK, which OK, will soon leave the EU um, on the 31st of December this year. It's slightly different. Periodic retesting of samples is done so that a defense of all reasonable precautions and all due diligence can be used in the event of an enforcement action by the UK regulator. That defense does not apply. In 